So, <clears throat> a doctor tells me that writing a diary might help me with the nightmares. <laughs> I didn't have the art to tell him I was dyslexic. So I thought, I know what I'll do. I'll record it instead. You'll like that. You can listen to it while it does the housework. <laughs> it's a bit weird though, talking to no one. So I know what I'll do. I will imagine a huge crowd hanging on me every word. That's you guys, you see. <laughs> You're not real. You're all in my head. That way I can record all of it. My thoughts, my feelings. You're not real, so you can't tell no one. So here goes. Well, that's the opening of uh, Shell Shock, a solo show I've been fortunate, fortunate enough to perform around the, all around the world. Uh, began at Edinburgh and Adelaide festivals in 2018. Um, the play is based on a novel by Neil Blower Watkins, a, uh, an Iraq Gulf War veteran who discovered through creative writing he could process his thoughts and feelings and in doing so bring a bit of order to the chaos in his brain caused by the effect of uh, post-traumatic stress. My job was simply to tell his story, engage audiences and encourage others to open up and talk about their experiences. So that's shell shock time to talk. That's my little show that I do. But today, having worked with Army at the Fringe at Edinburgh and Army at the Arts, um, and in keeping with the creative spirit of the Edinburgh Fringe, my job today is to present you with a range of new work, new writing, new creativity. And you're about to hear uh, the reflections of a wide variety of veterans and professionals who found writing about their experiences both helpful and cathartic. But first, Perhaps it is appropriate to offer a prayer. So here is Nelson on the eve of the Battle of Trafalgar. May the great God, whom I worship, grant to my country and for the benefit of Europe in general a great and glorious victory. And may no misconduct in any one tarnish it. And may humanity after victory be the predominant feature in the British fleet. For myself individually, I commit my life to him who made me. And may his blessings light upon my endeavours for serving my country faithfully. To him I resign myself and the just cause which is entrusted to me to defend. Amen. 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 Nelson, performed there by Nicholas Collett. Nick is a classical actor with a huge range of theatre experience. He's appeared in shows at the Edinburgh Fringe over many years, uh, recently writing and producing his own solo work, such as Nelson, which you've just seen a little bit of, and Spitfire Solo. Uh, Spitfire Solo is a, a deeply moving and poignant piece set in the year 2000 about an elderly former Spitfire pilot reassessing his life at the turn of the century. And in this little extract, here's Nick as the Spitfire pilot talking about the Battle of Britain. Well, we stopped the invasion. At what cost? In all, the RAF lost over 500 pilots and gunners killed in the Battle of Britain. The Germans had over 3,000 killed or captured. Sometimes I think about the mates I lost, but they're friendly ghosts. They died with honour, without reproach. The young of each generation are all the same. They may look and sound different, but they are the same. They do rise to the challenge. And I must rise to mine. The arts in general offer unique opportunities for outlet and US-Iraq war veteran, military spouse and scholar Mags Vibo utilises multiple disciplines in her work. Her collaborations in arts advocacy span print, broadcast and online media and she's produced an anthology of poetry by military veterans entitled My Teeth Don't Chew on Shrapnel. Look it up. My teeth don't chew on shrapnel. Here's a selection of her own visually illustrated poems. She's a remarkable artist and multidisciplined. Here's Mags. Hold the guac. One small pin between me and oblivion. And this is when it all begins to shake, rattle and roll out. Shout. But pretend this is when the fun begins. And I catch myself stuttering. For the first time in my life, pop goes the weasel 
from inside my vest, sinking into my chest, and I feel the weight of the world slung around my neck and hanging from my hips and dangling from my lips, which cry out to move out. We got a job to do now, protect the black gold as we head down the road. But wait, is that a wire with the trash strewn about? Because I need my head. It's how I stay undead in this dreaded debate about whether or not we shouldn't even be in the sand with my hands clutching the saw in this shocking and awing moment and the salt crusts my eyes and I wonder why I'm in the lead vehicle without any support. And this theme carries on like a reap eating song for the remainder of the years so that when a cough is more than a cold and becomes a scold from all that damn smoke that choked us out should have pulled it and saved the taxpayers a dime but I didn't Colors of battle, trapped inside, sweat beating, red to the forehead. Time ticks slowly by as I dread. One more second, more moments where nothing feels tangible in this blues reality. I miss the ghosts of battle, their stories echoing past. Fields which once harvested wheat, sweet thoughts of sunshine, on the brim, walking and talking without wearing a mask, black powder blasting, cadence echoing with strength, a purpose, driven towards a destiny where Ojibwa blood and sacrifice stains the sandy soil of this land. Our toil, our chance, impacting seven more, generations to ponder, wondering, did we get it right? Was this fight to the finish, or another plight, another century of oppression and discretion, when sharing so much except for that which matters, hands brushing which comes from sharing, scars, painting, reclaiming our rebirth. This is my home. I will consecrate it with love. Snappy sinks. I snap my fingers to the sounds of musket fire and whizzing rounds. I tell the crowds each snap for the fallen. One second, two. A hailstorm of shrapnel here near the mounds, redoubts, and forts. The sound like buzzing bees whizzing free as birds chirp obnoxiously. Listen to me tweet tweet of the seas of Tenoji, of the waves of the first of Maine, of the reeds in the bio Mato of skeleton cave and battles waged by hornets and by honeybees. I talk of the light, how it marks each breath of lit tobacco or certain death, of zeppelins, Tokyo and firebombs, a twinkle of one, then two, then more, staying close to the old growth, a sheltered cove, the cypress trees, in periled congery or wait to mow, and mysteries of synchrony, coordinated firing of neurons in the brain, contractions in the heart, of firefly graves, and our fresh new start. A lifetime of war in 250 words. How do I sum up an entire adult working lifetime spent at war? 
through poetry and explanation that I am the vessel that holds the heart of which art lies within. And what is art but a portrait of all the contradictions that make us human and inhumane? Art is a painting with all the strokes that show how love and conflict are married. And what is marriage if not a commitment to a vow? I am a veteran of the ultimate promise, a sergeant who stood atop the first civilization of war, now a civilian in an uncivilized world. I am a warrior for life. I am a soldier's spouse, a woman who explored the great wonders of the world and measured time by packing and unpacking boxes. I am a soldier's wife. I am a lifelong learner. And what is death, if not an answer for how to appreciate life? I am a student of strife. I am a soldier's house. And what is a map, if not countries with borders that don't really exist? I build a wall only to tear it down and build it back up again. I thrive as the maker of a worldwide battlefield. I stand as a testament to this moment and all the moments of insanity between heaven and hell. I am a machine, an endless loop, a foe, patsy, unemployed, underemployed, denied employment, feared, loathed, criticized, but still a life. Claire Hughes served in the RAMC from 2008 to 2013. She's recently completed her MA in Creative Writing and lives in Staffordshire. Claire's approach is more direct than some, but rooted in authenticity and integrity. Here's Claire. Day one, week one. March in, stand on the line and strip down to your underwear. Don't ask why, just stand and face your front. Weakness identified in the knee and shin. Standard for this model, but handy for week seven when we demolish and rebuild. Those soft edges will need sharpening and the muscles need defining. You'll have to hide those lumps on your chest. Keep your arms up and spread your legs. We need to take measurements for your new skin. We don't accommodate hips and tits, so just work a crease down each limb and you'll fit in. Be warned, DPM stains. You'll find traces of it in 10 years time. Behind your ears, under your nails, and though you will add layer upon layer of life and memory, nothing will cover it completely. Now sign here. Yes, it's a will, but for your pledge of death, we offer food and lodgings and a pension. When you're done, march on to the stores, swap your name for a number and continue to day two. Basic training. The OC delivers his orders and says march out is 0500 hours. That's five in the morning to you, wingnut, troop sergeant says, and make sure you're there five minutes before so we can leave bang on. Corporal says make sure you're there five minutes before that so I can check your kit. I don't want to get in the shit. Then Scout says I reckon we should do five minutes before that because pain always dicks about. And Titch says to go five minutes before that because sick note's bound to be limping. No, says Taff. Sick note's bedded down. But five minutes before is a good call because Ginger's a right jack bastard and we'll get beasted if we're late. So go five minutes before, the five minutes before and the one before that. Yeah? Right. Let's hurry up so we can wait. At home. I ask my mum for scoff because I can't get rid of the taste of biscuit browns from the rat packs. As she cooks, she asks if I want tea or coffee, so I shout for a Julie Andrews. Then we sit and I tell her about how our block is redders and we're all threaders with so-and-so because they're always on the biff. At the pub, my mates ask, what is it you do again? Well, I'm an ODP in the RAMC, so I pass the ET tube and refill the O2. But over at 3-3, I sort out the tentage, the click-clack flooring, count the cannulas, syringes, oxygen masks and scalpels. Make sure they don't disappear. Five, four, three, two, one. They've all gone when I come home two weekends later. Paper Dragon. I am wounded, not by bullets or explosions. 
My teeth don't chew on shrapnel, but my paper skin is burned and scalded by fingerprints. Fingerprints of the baby born with no face, of the teenager splintered and broken and stitched back up, the mother who now won't be a mother, the father who won't see Christmas, the double amputee who can't understand why you can't stop the pain in their phantom leg. I am no dragon. I didn't inherit the hide from my mother. I hide in dark rooms, try to layer over the cracks, but my skin is still paper. Offering perhaps a lighter take on this subject matter, Gavin Robertson is a well-known regular at the Edinburgh Fringe Festival, he appearing in many years in many different productions. And in recent years, he's appeared at the Edinburgh Fringe Festival as his alter ego, Greg Byron, stand-up poet. He is, uh, as I say, a highly experienced performer with an enviable CV, including multiple seasons in the West End in shows as diverse as Thunderbirds, FAB, and One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest with Christian Slater. But here he is as Greg Byron, Poet Supreme. Here he is. Hello there, I'm Greg Byron, and uh, very happy to be uh, taking part of this uh, Army at the Fringe, albeit a somewhat virtual experience. So I was asked to write something um, original, uh, so I've come up with this, but uh, you'll have to bear with me because it's so new, I haven't learnt it yet, so I'm having to read it. And uh, apologies for the sunglasses, but uh, I can't read the paper because it's too bright. <laughs> All right, here we go. It's called, uh, I think I'll join the Army. I can't be in the Air Force because I'm terrified of heights. The Navy's no good for me, I'm terrified of shark bites. I hear that in the Army you can get to drive a tank, so I think I'll sign their dotted line, depending on my rank. I'd like to be an officer, I think they get more pay, and frankly I'd be suited having privates doing what I say. I'm known for being bossy, so I think that might be apt. I'd have a unit under me to stop me being kidnapped if I end up in a foreign country trying to keep the peace. Uh, I wouldn't mind Iraq, because they say it's warm, like Greece. The training puts me off a bit. All dormitories and mud. I'm not so sure of fighting, because apparently there's real blood. I couldn't be a medic, because the training just takes ages. I'll be honest, what I really want is rank and decent wages. I've got to say, it's risky, though. I mean, you've got to weigh the balance. If there's fighting, me, I want a tank, not just a bloody ambulance. I get that I'll be shouted at and reduced to just a number. I get that I'll have nightmares and interrupted slumber. I get it's not for everyone. I probably won't get rich. I get that being shot at or that sleeping in a ditch is something that I'll probably do once or twice or more. On second thoughts, fuck all of that. I'll just stay home and pour. Dilemma, though. I'm pretty good at playing Call of Duty. I quite enjoy the CCF. I know how to salute I think I'll be a captain, just like I was at school. Admittedly at football. Hey, now what about the motor pool? Just make sure the vehicles are in order and they're clean. That's pretty safe. They're camouflaged, so very rarely seen. Just tell me where to sign me name. I'll see you in the mess. Just need to Google how to join and get the right address. Brigadier Tim Hodgetts is the head of Army Medical Services. As a specialist emergency medicine doctor, he has deployed to war and conflict zones for over 30 years, where he has been responsible for treating numerous casualties who have been critically injured in combat. Tim's way of dealing with what he's seen and done has been to reflect and record traumatic experiences as an anthology of war poetry. The uh, paintings that we're going to show you that accompany his poems were created by landscape and war artist Gordon Rushmer a renowned landscape painter and war artist who's worked in, in and experienced conflict in Bosnia, Kosovo, uh, Eritrea, Ethiopia, Afghanistan and Iraq. He has paintings in major collections around the world and recently had exhibitions at the Imperial War Museum and at the Tate Britain. So here's some poems by Tim Hodgetts, illustrated by Gordon Rushmer. Sniffer Dogs by Tim Hodgetts it's been a long day at the office. Where can relaxation be found? In the friendship with no strings or malice from the dogs in the working dog's pound. There are two types of dog and they differ. There is one type you don't want to stroke. The labs and the spaniels are sniffers. The Alsatians will go for your throat. A huddle of men come together, volunteers at walking out time to stretch the dog's legs on their tethers 
round the perimeter fence in a line. Without fear they lead out the soldiers to find IEDs by the road, disguised within roadkill or boulders with their sensitive noses as probes. When a working dog's injured on duty, the moral desire is to treat. While a bullet is kinder to set free, expectations are harder to meet. For doctors, it's not quite so simple. Though the hero dog's one of the crew, only vets can treat dogs. What the dickens does a doctor in dilemma do? Some of Tim Hodgett's poems perhaps bear a little explanation. Sniffer dogs you've just heard, a way to de-stress from the intense clinical activity in the field hospital at Camp Bastion was to volunteer at the military dog pound each afternoon to take a working dog for a walk, hence sniffer dogs. The next one you're going to hear is called Dressing the Dead. The responsibility for tending to the dead at a British field hospital has been adopted during operations in Kosovo, Iraq and Afghanistan by medical and nursing staff from the emergency department supported by the quartermaster's staff. In the established campaign in Afghanistan from 2009, the requirement to use clinical staff other than a doctor to pronounce death and generate an uh, international death certificate was removed by using dedicated mortuary staff. So that's Dressing the Dead. Dressing the Dead by Tim Hodgetts. Two bodies lay before me. Who they are, I cannot tell. Flesh charred by an explosion gives a sweet and sickly smell. A mortar round has landed on the internet welfare shack and roasted both in situ as they emailed family back. Their faces have been melted, no dog tags around their necks, only bits of clothing remnants to help ID by the med techs. Their limbs have all contracted, twisted postures fixed in death, as they force their legs out straight, exhale bubbles, mimic breath. My arms are caked in charcoal from where they rubbed on skin. My desert boots are soiled with blood and destined for the bin. The indignities completed, bodies bound and sealed in bags, the cold, grim reefer names the souls with male, large, unknown tags. Two medics are affected by what they've seen and done. I counsel them as I am numbed with wounds from bomb and gun. A Doctor or a Soldier First by Tim Hodges A doctor or a soldier first? A common ask by those unversed in risks they cannot understand, nor visualise like glove on hand, sits medicine on soldiering. For in dilemma floundering, young doctors in a firefight choose between their oath or life to lose, as Red Cross armbands have become the target for the sniper's gun, conventions from Geneva hold, a unilateral moral code. A soldier or a doctor first? My wounded ethics can be nursed. It's preferable than my brain spilled on poppies in an Afghan field. A doctor or a soldier is a response to the frequently asked question of the same ilk, whether Tim is a doctor or a soldier first and foremost, or whether the ethics of being a doctor fits with the practice of being a soldier. His answer is always, it depends. The next poem you're going to hear is called Field Dining. Uh, in the concentration phase prior to the Iraq War in 2003, UK troops assembled in Camp Coyote in Kuwait were provided with centralised catering for the cooked evening meal, stew distributed in insulating boxes, to minimise the opportunity of foodborne gastroenteritis. And then finally, perhaps appropriately, we finish with Death of a Clock from Tim's selection. Um, this is a, well, basically Tim living in a tent was subject to all sorts of noises around him, some which could occasionally be very irritating. For instance, the ticking of a clock. Field Dining by Tim Hodgetts. Oh God, it's dinner time again. What slop will they serve up today? For 30 days I've had brown stew, except once when it was grey. Poor food here is of course denied by a lame spokesman in Qatar, who's got the nerve to tell the news that our field catering is five star. Lunch is the US ready meal, a vegetable burrito. It's slimy, plastic, has no taste, appetising as a shoe sole. 
The joke is that the MREs, meals ready to eat for one, are really meals rejected by the starving Ethiopians. Salad we want, a lighter diet. It's bloody hot, the sun's intense. Instead, we're given Arctic packs, a lunatic choice that makes no sense. Into Iraq on dry rations, it's menu A, boil in the bag. Biscuits brown and turds in treacle, within a week I start to flag. At last, the fresh food does arrive. Eggs, fruit, veg, fish, meat, poultry, cheese. But with it, an unwanted flood of Norwalk virus, D and V. Death of a Clock by Tim Hodgetts. Tick-tock, sprawled on our camp cots. Tick-tock, beneath our fly nets. Tick-tock, the tent is airless. Tink-tock, I wouldn't care less if you'd shut up that ticking clock. Tick-tock, each night I'm woken. Tick-tock, to tend bodies broken. Tick-tock, I can't do my best. Tick-tock, if I've had no rest, so shut up that bloody clock. Tick-tock, I've lost perspective. Tick-tock, to live and let live. Tick-tock, there's one solution. Bang, bang, it's execution of that fecking ticking clock. Nanis Kualobulo Wasai Kibara is from Fiji and married to a serving member of the armed forces in the British Army. She is a wife and mum of four, whilst also working for the MOD as a commercial manager and aims to balance all the demands of life without guilt or stress. That's her aim. Nanis has no formal creative writing training, but has kindly contributed a really heartfelt response, which I think speaks for itself. Here's Nanis. I boarded the flight and left the shores of my island home, Fiji, that I adore. Over 9,000 miles, the distance, I had to fly to the United Kingdom, her rule, I have to comply. Joining my husband was such a delight. The first few months seemed all right. As the days went by, I had the fright to learn they were soon to be deployed to war zone sites. His burden all packed and ready to go. The six months tour, only God knows what the future will bring, only time could tell. I pray for their lives and safe journey back. Settling down in a foreign land with our very young boys who did not understand the challenges I faced as an army wife, I put on a brave face and said, everything is all right. The three Scots welfare team I'd like to thank for having the time to listen to all my crap, organizing activities, day out, and even weekends. Life would have been difficult if it weren't for them. Coming out of my shell, I continue to explore the way of living I greatly adore. I opted to mingle than being boxed in the house to make new friends with fellow army spouse. We're also fortunate to have uh, some contributions here from Louise Fazakali, who will introduce herself. So over to Louise. Hi, uh, I'm Louise and um, my partner Daniel got discharged from the army a few years ago with uh, PTSD. Uh, I wrote a CD about it and I've just got a new little book coming out which I'm really excited about which has got all the poems about our experiences when he was in Afghanistan and I was at home uh, with two small girls and um, so this is uh, one of the poems and it's called Daddy's Boat. She made you a little boat with a margarine tub bottom and an orange paper sail. I can't fold that into a British Forces Post Office email. You missed her first day at school. You missed her nativity play. Six months tour. Your theatre is war. You ring insecure on an unsecure line. I witter on house, kids, work, omitting drinks with a male friend. Paranoid thoughts, another insurgent, your letters bleed, a sleepless hell of gunshot wounds and hobbled little boys. Patch them up and send them on to guns, not toys. 
and I can't think straight about the things you're learning while she is learning. What you're destroying while she is creating. I'm almost hating you, the army and this world. Shake myself and get a grip. There must be more to life than this. With a bright idea and a bit of hope, I take this childish, fragile bolt. Get a shoebox to send to Afghanistan, tissue paper crumpled in. I can't let you sink. I need you to swim. So put all your death long days and your loneliness and the scurry stuff into this boat she made for you. The love should stop it seeping through. Or oh, somebody stop this happening to us. Somebody stop this happening to me. When you come home, we'll launch that boat and you and I will be free. And the next piece I'm going to do is later on in the collection and it's called Weather Report. Were the snow globe in summer, were the sand globe in winter, at night the temperature falls, I curl round him to keep him warm, he's like a corpse, there's no response. It's cluttered in here, in this head-shaped dome, this unwanted gift from his little trip abroad, the turn of the, the night and day of the glass globe, a glass Tent. Standard army um, issue. They give them to soldiers like soldiers throwing sweets to kids. It's put in here. At night, the temperature drops. Afghanistan, like nowhere else in the world, he sleeps with his boots on and shakes like a feral dog. Call it glass house. Call it fish tank. Call it home, sweet home. It's cluttered in here with broken things. A limb has bent at the elbow and punched the light socket in the front room. The crack in the plastic is the same shape as lightning. When a mine shaft collapses, it leaves the same shape in the earth as a punch in a chipboard door. The baby gate flung down the stairs, the golf clubs wrap round trees, the window put through glass to glass, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, and his throat so dry, he's got to have a drink with all that. A man can have a drink in his own house, can't he? Isn't that what we was fighting for? And there's a bit of him under my fingernails, there's a bit of him under my fingernails and Bolton comes over and he can see that I'm struggling and he pours. I can't open the door in case the nightmares fly out. I can't open the door in case he screams and somebody hears him. I can't open the door in case the sand pours out and it makes a roadblock in the road and no one can get to work and everyone sinks in it and I can't open the door because of all the blood. Oh, it's sort of safe in here, in this glass house, our fingers pressed against the glass as you and you and you walk past. Because we're the snow globe in summer, we're the sand globe in winter, we're the snow globe in summer, we're the sand globe in this indeterminable winter. Thank you, I hope you've enjoyed that. And if you'd like to listen to my poems, you can find my website, Louise the Poet. Just Google Louise Poet Wiggin and come up. Uh, and the book's coming out in September, and I'm really excited. And it's got some land days in, which are like an, um, a push to a poetry form that women write. So, um, so that's a bit exciting for me as well. Okay, thank you for listening. Bye. Neil Watkin is a former soldier who served in the Royal Tank Regiment, including in the Gulf War, and is now an NHS paramedic. His semi-biographical novel, Shell Shock, The Diary of Tommy Atkins, was written as part of his journey through PTSD. Adapted for the stage and produced at Army at the Fringe in 2018, Shell Shock has since toured the world and is followed by talkbacks wherever we go, led by a professional counsellor, ensuring that Neil's inspiring story of recovery provides a, a kickstart for others. His tale is a, a story of resilience and recovery. He's battled really hard, he's reinvented and finally qualified as a paramedic. 
It sounds like a line, uh, but what I'm going to tell you is absolutely true. On the day that I opened Shell Shock uh, um, in Edinburgh at Army at the Fringe, just before I went on stage, my phone beeped. Now, I know I should have turned it off, right? But I glanced at it, and it was a message from Neil. And the message went, good luck, mate, on your opening night. I just want you to know that yesterday I saved my first life. Well, here's a bit more of his work. Uh, Neil's work, reflecting on his early experiences in the army, a read for us by a professional actor. I am the brightest light. I am the darkest shadow. I am the balance of justice. I am the deep well of despair. I am the darkness. I am the light. I am the spirit that makes you willing to fight. I am the shadows haunting your nights. I am the strength that makes evil take flight. I am the truth, I am the lie, I am the child that wants you to fly, I am life, I am death, I am there when you take your first and last breath. In the darkest night, on the brightest day, always remember, never forget, the darkest shadow comes from the brightest day. That face in the darkness, as pure as the snow, that face in the darkness where evil things grow, that face are you a monster or you a man? Innocence lost forever, but I'll do what I can. That face. You stole something precious, a legend to all, but my friend Jim made sure you'd fall. That face. That face in the void. The dark recesses of my mind. I hope that you are glad that we repaid you in kind. That face. The music starts and my eyes fill with tears. Will it be like this forever, for all my remaining years? The bugler blows and the flag is slowly lowered. I can't hear that music and not think I'm a coward. Why am I here and there rotting in the ground? The screams of young boys dying lay writhing on the ground. Then the music stops and the padre starts to speak. And I can't help but feel the redness of my cheeks. Thank you, thank you, from the bottom of my heart, the town of Wootton Bassett, for playing your part. You might not think it's special, but I assure you that it's true. The whole United Kingdom owes a debt to you. You taught us how to show respect, with dignity and with kind. You put the grieving families at the forefront of our minds. You're royal now, and about time too. Thank you, Wootton Bassett. You're a hero too. Now a bit of a, a late entry. Um, doing this project has been a real privilege. It's been a genuine privilege to receive such uh, personal um, contributions from people. None more so than this. Uh, Jamie Brody introduces it herself. Um, uh, here's Jamie. Hi, my name is Jamie Brody, and I'm going to be reading a poem I wrote at the um, Oxford Brooks Veteran Writing, um, Veteran Poetry Writing Conference earlier in the year and it's titled, My Body Is. While I was writing this poem, I was um, thinking about how a combat zone can be more than a geographical space or um, a combat arena, how it can be an internal space, it can occupy um, a physical, personal space. And so that's uh, how I was approaching this poem titled, My Body Is. My body is in line at the mess hall at Hanau. The lead line cook, a slim grizzled man says, I have a message for you. Meet me out back after dinner. On my plate, a mound of boiled yellow potatoes, soft splayed vegetables, a bit of salt and fruit. My belly, once ready, is coiled, nervous, refusing this heaped mash. I wonder, not at the Bosnian war, another religious faction war, but at the mysterious message this cook carries and whether I'll receive it. He is not my chain of command. I need not meet him. Behind the mess hall, he says, meet the officer at midnight. The sky is already darkening behind him, the silhouette of two hawks circling. I stand near the metal doors only he can return through. He drove past you, he liked your smile. The officer is kind and becomes like a friend. He drives a motorcycle and gives me a ride and remembers to warn me about the muffler. 
When he's deployed downrange, he becomes a pen pal. Later, a refracted image on a television screen talking to Oprah about leadership. He seems kind still, this war-torn veteran. His friend, the lieutenant, though, he raped me and Hannah while I was sleeping. This was unexpected. A scattered group of us sleeping it off after a party in an officer's apartment. He too seemed kind and he had a fiance back home. That's what I was thinking, but I thought he had a fiance back home. There is a man, one arm against the wall, peeing onto a suitcase beneath the window. I wrap my hand around my wrist to remember when I was a child. My body is, my body is, my body is mine. Thank you for listening. When he found out that I was doing this project for Army at the Fringe, um, my friend Matty Deverson sent me a few words inspired by the story of a Somalian athlete whose only escape from the hell of civil war was to run. Here they are, read to us by Toby. He ain't no soldier. He ain't no military man. He's got no guns or cigarettes, just a smile and a hole in his old worn running vest. Training in the dusty heat, the sound of gunfire, part of everyday life. But against all odds, he makes it down that dusty road again. But against all odds, he makes it down that road of death. So run, run, don't look behind you. You gotta stay alive. Run, run 5,000 steps to the finish line. Strong like his brothers, he's got soul like no other. With execution all around, don't make a sound. Be quick, make your escape. But against all odds, he makes it down that dusty road again. But against all odds, he makes it down that road of death. So Neil Watkins' script Shell Shock that I perform uh, is available uh, to view on YouTube. Uh, we'll put up a link below uh, if you want to go and have a look at that. Um, I'm also working on a new project which is linked still to the army in the sense in that it's a, a, a Sherlock Holmesian piece. It's uh, Watson, The Final Problem, which tells the story all about how Watson did battle with uh, Moriarty, uh, including the, the scene at the Reichenbach Falls that many will, will know. Uh, what many people don't know about uh, about Dr. Watson was that, of course, he served in an earlier Afghanistan uh, campaign, um, and it looks as though we haven't really learned very much over the years, does it? Still going back to Afghanistan. Um, and he talks here about his experience. Get that stretcher over here. Those two men, go back. No, leave him, leave him. Keep pressure on that wound. Move, man! Murray, Murray, bring my bag over! The war in Afghanistan brought honours and promotion to many, but to me it brought nothing but misfortune and disaster. I took two bullets from a Jezel rifle, filthy things, one in the leg, one in the shoulder. The bones were shattered. I would have fallen into the hands of the enemy, but somehow Murray, my orderly, threw me across a pack horse and got me safely back to the British lines. Brave man, dead now. I was worn and weary and sick of the sights that I'd seen, and I came down with enteric fever. For a time my life was despaired of, and I despaired of life. Finally, weak and emaciated, I was dispatched home. Six weeks at sea in an overcrowded troopship, and, and then I landed at Portsmouth with my health in ruins and my nerves in shreds. I was barely able to help myself, let alone anyone else. You know, when you apply to medical school, they ask you why you want to become a doctor. I told them I wanted to make a difference in the world, I wanted to be of use. That's what I was born to do, I told them. I was young and I was innocent and they'd heard it a thousand times before, of course, but the fact was, I genuinely believed it. I really did think that one man could make a difference, and all through my training I still believed it. I was the very model of the idealistic young doctor. Then, after I qualified, I joined the army and was dispatched to India, to the northwest frontier, an idealistic young man in an ancient land. 
but I soon discovered that an Afghan bullet doesn't care how old you are, a bomb doesn't care about your lofty ideals, and a, a Kyber knife doesn't give a damn as it slits your throat. I saw friends and comrades butchered in front of my eyes, and I grew up pretty fast. Before, before those two bullets closed that particular chapter and sent me home. So there I was, back home. Well, naturally enough, I gravitated to London. To that great cesspool that sucks in all the loungers and idlers of the empire, where I too could drain away to nothing. Some of the most prolific contemporary poetry is perhaps to be found in song. My friend Matty Deverson and writing partner Will Page are otherwise known as the Noble Jacks. Noble Jacks are a hard-working, touring rock folk band with sold-out shows across the UK from festivals such as Glastonbury, the Isle of Wight and Bestival. Their second album, Stay Awake, went straight into the top ten official album charts. The band write foot-stomping tunes and are particularly known for their beautiful, poetic and poignant lyrics, often about difficult issues and based on traumatic personal experiences. They say that they have embraced the notion of music as an antidote to unhappiness. As one reviewer put it, a Noble Jacks gig is the place to be because Noble Jacks do care and do want to bring a little light into the darker corners of our souls. So yes, those words that Matty sent me are a song, and in this environment it seems entirely appropriate for the Jacks to play us out. Here, especially recorded in true acoustic lockdown style, are Will, Matty and Jack. The Noble Jacks. Thank you for watching. I hope to see you later in the week. One, two, three, four. Then wrote it down.